Two way car for a medical. Daisley Park, 7801 Audubon Road. 7801 Audubon Road for a fail down not to read you. Especially since they're in the right now. And this is the medical Daisley Park, 7801 Audubon Road. Person down not breathing, can you proceed in three times? Please responded to Paisley Park uh, to look for him and found him unresponsive in the elevator. We have no reason to believe at this point that this was a suicide. Prince transcended music. From song to song, he transformed and innovated. He was more than just an artist. He was an icon. I Want to Be Your Lover, Little Red Corvette, and of course, Purple Rain. He delivered massive hit after massive hit, pushing the boundaries of his craft. But Prince was not untouchable. In the years leading up to his death, the superstar began to appear increasingly frail, and a series of dramatic events would lead up to those devastating final moments. The month leading up to Prince's death is, is an extraordinary tale in itself. At the beginning of April, he, he canceled a couple of concerts, uh, ostensibly because he was poorly, or, but it was actually to give him time to recover from what was then an, an, an opioid addiction. April 21st, 2016, 9.43 a.m. An emergency call is made from Prince's Paisley Park Mansion. 10.07 a.m. Emergency responders arrive at Paisley Park and Prince is pronounced dead. The autopsy this morning began at 9 a.m. Central Daylight Time and concluded at 1 p.m. And just shortly I received word that his body did leave Midwest Medical Examiner's Office and was released to the family. Join us as we investigate the last 24 hours of Prince. This man is one of the most committed artists I've ever known. And by that, I mean committed to music utterly. And he was able to do almost everything. Prince's success is a testament to nothing but sheer dedication and hard work. With over 100 million records sold, 39 studio albums, and seven Grammy Awards, his work continued to wow, shock, and surprise throughout his extensive career. To say that he was prolific would be an understatement. His genius was unrestrained, it was unstoppable. He wrote his first song when he was, I think, seven years old. And he went on to sell over 100 million albums, 100 million albums. He became one of the most iconic artists of all time. He contributed to fashion, he contributed to film, he contributed to music. But the one constant in his life that sustained him and sustained his creativity was his work ethic. One of Prince's greatest talents as an artist was to connect, to engage, to compel. People couldn't look away from his music. In the 1999 BET Tonight interview, uh, Prince you know, famously said that, that he got into music and, and, he, and he got into doing what he, do, what he does. Uh, because just because he loved playing, you know, jumping off pianos, as he says in the interview. But you, you, you still like going out doing dates? Oh man, that's that's my life. Uh, I got into the music business because I loved playing so much. Mm -hmm. um, you don't 
really get into the business to be a star, at least I didn't. I didn't get in to make a whole bunch of money or anything like that and meet a whole bunch of women. Mm -hmm. Just so happens those are the things that came along with it. But uh, uh, I was always uh, playing a lot and uh, uh, it, it's what it's all about, jumping off pianos. It's, it's, it's all about life. jumping off pianos yeah, that's and hurting your foot when you jump. The sense you get from him is that and these are his, his words, you know, the art came first, the money and the women came after. And that, again, keys into a number of things, not least of which was his work ethic. The world is full of people who want the world and they want it now. They want the money, they want the women, they want the sex, they want the fame, they want the adoration, but they don't put the time or the effort and they don't have the kind of intense passion for their art that Prince did. And it's that line that separates genius, if you want, those who go on to become artists of the caliber of Prince, and there's not many of them around. Prince, you know, is in a very small, thin group of the most iconic figures of 20th and 21st century art. One of the things that Prince will always be remembered for is the way that he could change genre of music absolutely fluently, whether it was pop or rock or funk or R&B. And he didn't just do it album to album. He would change completely the style of music from song to song on an album. So what was so revolutionary about this man is that he was completely fluent across a wide range of styles of music. And he loved to fuse them together in different ways and experiment in a way that no one really did that to that degree before or since. When you think about Prince, you really kind of imagine what you see in the video for Purple Rain. First of all, he's in purple, he's on stage, he's performing, he's a superstar, and he's putting out this very sexy, powerful stage presence. Despite the fact that he's not a very big guy, he has a very big presence, and, and when he's on stage, he looks like a very large individual. And I think what you see in Purple Rain is kind of uh, scenes from the film, the very famous film, of course, called Purple Rain, kind of weaved throughout the video. The story here is about a performer, a guy that fronts a band, who gets up on stage and sings, who has a very complicated personal life. It's dark, it's not exactly a happy uh, song, but there's a lot of overtures of this kind of gothic romanticism that we see from Prince throughout his career. I think Purple Rain is an incredible song. It's an anthem of sorts. And, you know, there's a lot of apocryphal imagery. Prince was asked about it many times, and he did have a real fascination at the time about the apocalypse and the end of the world. And Purple Rain is really about when the sky turned red and blue and rained purple, and it's the end of the world, and it's being with the person you love and your God at that time. That's what Prince is basically alluded to later in life. He was brought to the attention of Warner Brothers Records by a local Warner Brothers representative who said that we have this fantastic kid in uh, Minnesota and you've really got to hear him. And they signed him up and they said, and we think he's so good, we're going to have him work with Maurice White. They recommended that he work with Maurice White, the recently deceased eminence of Earth, Wind and Fire. Now in the late 1970s, you couldn't get a hotter producer than Maurice White, unless it was Barry Gibb. It was a complete surprise that Prince said, no, I'm gonna do myself. And, and he did all the instruments himself. So even from the ages of 17 and 18, he was completely determined to be in charge of his own career. The Dirty Mind album was quite unfit for radio airplay for princely reasons you can imagine. Although, uh, When You Were Mine was a great song, uh, which has become a standard of sorts recorded by various artists, including Cindy Lauper. And we really didn't know if he was going to put it back on the rails until 
Hill Controversy came out. Now, at this point, this was four albums in four years, and this was the pace at which he was going to continue throughout the 1980s. 1999 may be called 1999, but this is a quintessential 1980s music video. Everybody has big hair. Everybody seems to have a perm. You've got a lot of um, the kind of one-handed gloves and the hat and the asymmetric hairstyle and all the other things that you associate with 1980s. It has the feel of a 1980s song. It has very much the look of a 1980s song. You see Prince on stage with his band performing. And this is all about highlighting his concert presence, his stage presence, and showing that he knows how to have a good time. He was very much a trailblazer in so many respects. His video for Little Red Corvette, for instance, that, you know, along with Michael Jackson's Billie Jean, paved the way for black artists to be represented on MTV. Where he could innovate, he would always just want to push the boundaries. And that's the sign of a great artist. In the video for Kiss, we see Prince in this very sexy two-piece outfit. The top almost looks like a woman's uh, exercise midriff top, and he's wearing like black lycra leggings. It's a very feminine, androgynous look for Prince. A lot of Prince's um, breaking down of barriers had to do with the way that he was appearing to be two genders at the same time. And in this video, we see him in a way kind of prancing around as if he's a very sexy woman in heels, bearing her midriff. But at the same time, he's very much a man who is masculine, who's sexual, and who wants a woman. So it's an interesting combination, and it's, it's a motif that Prince would play with throughout his career, including ultimately wanting to be called a symbol that was both male and female. The Sign of the Times was the first pop hit to make reference to AIDS, the disease of the 1980s. And he even recorded it first a year before it came out. But uh, even after that year's wait, which nobody knew was a wait, it still was a breakthrough. That's how ahead of the, of the times he was. In the 1999 uh, BET Tonight interview, uh, Prince talked about perhaps one of the most controversial things that he did, which was to change his name from Prince to the artist formerly known as Prince or the artist or, and he created a love symbol to, to represent that. And what was fascinating about what he said was, and controversial about what he said, was he described himself as a slave. And he makes it clear he's not talking about the kind of slavery that African Americans had to endure when they first came to, the, to, to America. That's not the kind of slavery he's talking about. He says, yes, he says, it's relative. But Prince was in a trap. Prince was in, under contract to, Prince was owned, mm -hmm. you know. Um, now, I can't use Purple Rain. I can't use this song. I can't sell the song Purple Rain now unless I record it again, mm -hmm. which I have plans to do if I can't, in fact, get the master recording that I believe is uh, one of my children, <laughs> you know. So um, uh, I did. I had to get freed from the uh, the mentality of being a slave. You understand? Right. Okay, and that's not to equate myself with the same uh, situations that we suffered coming to this country. But, you know, everything is relative. If you are owned, you are owned. If you can't do everything that you want to do, if there's a ceiling and you're not allowed to go as high as you can go, you are in fact a slave. Rather tellingly, he says, if you're owned, you're owned. And if you can't do everything you want to do, then you're a slave. And that sums up both Prince's desire to control his own destiny and his obsessive 
compulsion to be the best possible artist that he could be, which is that kind of rare drive that only artists of the caliber of Prince and only an artist like Prince could do. That is what made him what he is. It's that determination to be free, to express himself and push whatever boundaries he wants to push in his own way and on his own terms. And for somebody as creative and as controlling as Prince, the idea of being denied that freedom would indeed have been quite rightly described as a kind of emotional or creative slavery. And that's what he was driving at. And he didn't just want it for himself. He would have wanted that for any artist. He would not want to see any artist unable to express himself or herself to the absolute pinnacle of their creativity. He understood what makes great art, and he was determined to have the freedom to pursue it on his own terms. February 4th, 2007. At the Super Bowl in Miami, Florida, Prince delivers what is regarded as the greatest Super Bowl halftime show of all time. Prince's Super Bowl performance in 2007 is widely believed to be the best and greatest Super Bowl performance of all time. Critics absolutely were blown away by his stage presence and the magnificence of his performance. You have to picture the scene. It's in Miami and it is pouring rain. It's one of the only times it has poured rain at halftime in the Super Bowl in history, if not the only time. Another thing he did, which was extraordinary, was to cover other songs during the performance. Mostly when Super Bowl artists are asked to perform, they do their own music. And that's maybe they invite a guest singer to come in and do a song like we saw with Coldplay and Beyonce. But generally, they do their own songs. What Prince did was to cover other songs, such as Jimi Hendrix and the Foo Fighters, in the midst of this incredible performance of his own hit. And everyone was incredibly excited to see Prince show up, standing outside, getting completely soaked, and yet didn't take away an ounce from the high-powered energy and, and sheer amazingness of his performance. He was so, so really uh, totally in control of his own materials that he would only release to social media what he wanted out there. I mean, he's, he's really one of the artists who most controlled the dissemination of their images. But in the case of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, that was a public event. In the case of the Super Bowl, it's a public event. So you can see the Super Bowl and son of a gun, it starts raining when he's singing Purple Rain and the stadium is full and everyone's doing the ooh thing. And uh, it's one of those moments when everything comes together. It's perfect. Y you couldn't have a more perfect moment. And uh, I thought how thrilling for him. Also, thank heaven the lights worked so that the symbol worked and so forth. Um, so that's the thing with these Super Bowl performances. What if the lights don't work? That's so embarrassing. Um, but uh, it worked. And that was a great one because it was an artist who was doing a greatest hits set, uh, a heritage artist. It wasn't somebody who, who was bound to have a success because they were doing Uptown Funk, who'd been the, which had been the hit of the year. It wasn't like a top of the pops type thing. It was, here's a great artist doing his thing. I think what Prince very, in a very savvy way, did here was to give the public what he knew they wanted, was a rip-roaring good time full of high energy and music that they love.
Scott Wells' theory of the 10,000 hours. That is to say that even the most talented people get better and refine their art through just doing something for 10,000 hours. The Beatles put in 10,000 hours playing in the clubs of Hamburg every night, uh, sometimes up to seven hours. And uh, Mozart, starting at the age of five, put in 10,000 hours before his greatest masterpieces. And uh, it was, uh, surely Prince put in 10,000 hours, there's no doubt about it. And he was putting it in from an early age. Remember, both his parents were musicians. And he loved all kinds of music. One of his best quotes was that all my friends like a certain type of music, but I like all types of music. I listened to James Brown and Fleetwood Mac. And that helps explain why he appealed to the broadest possible audience. When you hear a foreign language spoken in the home growing up, you can speak it as an adult. And by listening to all these forms of music during his formative years, Prince could speak them. But beneath the giant persona that the world saw on stage was a problem that was becoming increasingly troubling. April 7th, 2016. Prince cancels two concerts in Atlanta, blaming the flu. But Dr. Michael Todd Schulenberg is treating Prince's withdrawal from his opioid addiction. For Prince, like for others before him, the doctors who administered those drugs to him were little more than legalized drug pushers. Months leading up to Prince's death is, is an extraordinary tale in itself. At the beginning of April, he, he cancelled a couple of concerts. Uh, ostensibly because he was poorly or but it was actually to give him time to recover from what was then an, an, an opioid addiction. On April the 15th he's on a plane. Nobody knows really what happened on that plane uh, or what the exact sequence of events was. But we know the end point of that was Prince being taken very ill and falling unconscious. What's the nature of the emergency? What's the nature of the... An unresponsive passenger. Uh, was it a male or female passenger? Oh, it's a male passenger. April 15th, 2016, 1.15 a.m. Emergency landing of Prince's private jet after being unresponsive. He was transported to hospital and given a shot of Narcan, an antidote often administered for suspected drug overdoses. He was administered with Narcan, which is an anti-opioid medication. And this, in effect, if you put it rather graphically, kicks the opioids out of the opioid receptors and helps normalize the, uh, the breathing and, and, and other bodily functions which the opioids had disturbed. He was told to remain in the hospital for at least 24 hours to recover, but checked himself out of hospital just three hours later. He's then asked to go into hospital. He's supposed to be in hospital for a few days. Uh, he checks himself out after three hours. I mean, to understand addiction, you first of all have to understand how the reward circuitry in the brain works. So in a nutshell, a rather simplified nutshell, uh, what happens is 
you have the ventral tegmental area, which is somewhere down here, and that releases a neurotransmitter called dopamine. The dopamine then goes up the nucleus accumbens, which is to do with motor function and motivation, and then that goes through to the prefrontal cortex. So in a very simplified way, addiction starts with a release of dopamine, goes to the nucleus accumbens and into the prefrontal cortex. Now, reward circuitry in the brain has enormous evolutionary advantages. Okay? We have to want to have, want food, sugar, salt, pleasure. All these things have great survival value for us as a species. But what happens in addiction, this reward circuitry gets hijacked, gets kidnapped, and it gets kidnapped by cocaine or prescription drugs like benzodiazepines or opioids, or it gets hijacked by porn, or it gets hijacked by the drive for pleasure and ever extreme sensations, be it through the consent or non-consent of other people. So this addictive, this reward circuitry can be really beneficial to us or it can destroy us. With performers like Prince, that's what happened. The reward circuitry got hijacked. And it got hijacked in one case by cocaine, in another case by prescription opioids. And let's have a look for a moment at what these prescription drugs do. There is a myth, perhaps it's a myth that Prince believed in, that these opioids or these drugs, because they are prescribed, that you can't get addicted to them, or there's nothing wrong with it, or it gives people a false sense of security. But that's not the case. And broadly, there are three classes, if you want, of prescription drugs which can become very destructive. You've got your opioids, okay, and, uh, which are usually painkillers. You've got what's called your central nervous system depressants. These typically are benzodiazepines. I guess most people would know ones like Xanax or Valium. And then you've got your stimulants, like your amphetamines. And whereas they can all provide useful clinical functions, they can also drive us into addiction and into dependency. And what happens in dependency is this, because dopamine is the insatiable neurotransmitter, it can never get enough. It never stops wanting more. And, uh, and what happens is, is eventually the reward system of the brain becomes completely depleted, exhausted. So if you want, addiction goes through four phases. First, there's desensitization. When you're an addict, you become desensitized to what once gave you pleasure, now simply causes you pain. Because you are driven to consume more, whatever your drug of choice is, be it a prescription drug, be it a, an, an illegal drug, be it sex, be it pornography, whatever your, your substance of choice is, eventually you become desensitized to it. We call it tolerance. So it doesn't do for you what it used to do in the past. But equally, you are still highly sensitive to the source of your addiction. So when you see a line of cocaine, or when you're given a packet of, of Xanax, or when you're given some opioids, or when you're given, you know, uh, we're looking at some pornography, whatever the addiction is, you're highly sensitive to that as a cue, because that's telling you, oh great, this is where I get the pleasure, this is where I get the hit, this is what I need. Yeah. And uh, then you get what's called hypofrontality. And hypofrontality is when your prefrontal cortex if you want your willpower collapses so you no longer have any control and uh, and uh, so the prefrontal cortex effectively becomes disabled and finally your stress your your stress mechanism if you want goes into overdrive you feel consciously anxious wired stressed so desensitization sensitization hyperfrontality and really a dysfunctional stress system that's addiction and uh, and they call it in essence there's the three c's if you want of addiction uh, the first C is the craving, the dopamine, give me more, give me more, give me more. Then you've got a loss of control, and then you have the negative consequences on your life. The fundamental thing about addiction and about the way dopamine works is it's a search for novelty. We always want something new. So what one line of cocaine or one, one or two or three opioids did for you yesterday, they won't do it today and they won't do it tomorrow. So you have to have more. In the same way that Prince is hard to pin down when it comes to one musical genre type, Prince was very much an enigma across his entire career. He refused to be pinned down even in terms of gender. Was he male? Was he female? Was he gay? Was he straight? Was he black? Was he white? He was, he was definitely black, but in some of his videos, he has so much face powder on, he looks completely white. 
His style of dressing, it's, it's masculine, but it's super feminine. His sexuality was very much a male predator who was gonna seduce a young woman, but he was also hyper-feminine. Prince was an enigma in that you couldn't really put your finger on who and what he was, and that was part of his appeal. It is without a doubt that on stage, Prince was a giant, but that didn't come naturally to a man who, throughout his career, suffered immense anxiety and stage fright. Friends and colleagues of the artist have spoken about his obsessive pursuit of perfection when it came to performing. He would rehearse and record days on end until everything was absolutely as he envisioned. There's a wonderful anecdote which was narrated by Prince's publicists, and they say that after a performance, he would make the band watch a video of the show they'd just performed. So they'd all sit, sit backstage, and every time he spotted a bum note, he would berate the person who did it. That is what it meant to work for Prince. And whereas at times it could and was undoubtedly overbearing and relentless, that's just how you get better at stuff. And that's why Prince was an inspiration. You know, artists like that don't just happen overnight. They have to work at it. And that anecdote really sums up that obsessive, driven desire to just reach a pinnacle of creative achievement that no other artist had ever done. And you have to have that dynamic going on to perform as beautifully and to create as prolifically as an artist like Prince. Because there's one fact about perfectionists and narcissists, but particularly true of perfectionists, and the two are very closely linked, is that they can't, they can't ever be good enough. If you're a perfectionist, you never reach perfection. And you're always striving to do it. You want more and more and more and more. Let's just make this right. Let's just make this right. But it's never good enough. You've always got to improve. And it's that narcissism, that perfectionism, and that incredible creative drive and work ethic that goes to make a genius like Prince. In addition to all of the reports about Prince's clean living, his veganism, his Jehovah's Witness beliefs, there are also a wide array of reports about his opiate addiction, about his love of pills, and some of the less kind of clean living uh, things that may have happened towards the end of his life and in fact contributed to his death. I'm thinking, so here's this guy, five foot two, and he's been on heels for 38 years. Surely he's gonna have hip pain and he's taking painkillers. Well, I could easily understand an addiction to painkillers or an overdose to painkillers. Dr. D, who claims to be, Prince is a drug dealer, and again, we don't know whether this is the case or not, said that he never met anybody who suffered as much stage fright as Prince. And this ties in to the narcissism that was at the heart of his personality. The man who, on the one hand, has to be bigger, greater, and grander than the rest, carries that private vulnerability, that naked, raw insecurity, which is part of the drive that makes him perform. The man who, on the one hand, is too frightened to go on stage, yet when he's on stage, he's too obsessive, too driven to come off it. That combination is toxic, as well as responsible for the work of so many great artists. And perhaps that's what artists like Prince, that's the price they pay for the creativity. It's the, it's the Faustian pact, if you want, that they make, give me my creativity, give me my art, and I will give you my life. So if Prince used drugs, either prescription or, or illegal, his publicist Chris Poole, his former publicist Chris Poole suggested, it wasn't for recreational use, it wasn't because he wanted to get high, it was to feed the monster that was within him which is what drove his creativity. It was to feed his creativity. So let's just look at that sequence of events. First of all, he cancels concerts because of his addiction. Then, because of his addiction, he falls unconscious on, on, a, on a plane flight. He then is, a, is taken to hospital because of his addiction where he's, he's asked, told to stay, but he checks himself out. And there's two things going on at that moment when Prince says, I'm out of here. One is, 
his intolerance of being told what to do. And that's not a, a comment, there's not a judgment on, on Prince or anybody else who, of that iconic stature, of which there are very few artists who reach that stature. But he's used to getting his own way. If he doesn't want to stay somewhere, he's not going to stay. And the second thing, perhaps, it's his narcissism, his sense of invincibility. I can cope. It's denial. I can cope. I can leave here, I'm fine. But of course, he wasn't fine. And the cancelling of the concerts, and the incident on the plane, and him being put into hospital, were all signs of what was to come just a few days later. To our for a medical, Paisley Clark, 7801 Audubon Road, 7801 Audubon Road, for a fail down that tree. Rescues and surgery, you know. And CNN has now confirmed that the artist Prince is dead. He was found in his elevator, unresponsive, in his compound, uh, Paisley Park in Minneapolis. The, the number of songs, seven-time Grammy winner, 30 nominations, the number of songs that have touched people's lives throughout uh, his entire career, uh, this is going to be very, very hard news to take. April 16th, 2016. Prince holds a party for close friends at his Paisley Park mansion. He shows off his new purple instruments. April 20th, 2016. Schulenberg treats Prince again for withdrawals. Later that night, a representative of Prince contacts a Californian addiction specialist, Dr. Howard Cornfield. He is asked to intervene in the megastar's crippling opioid addiction. However, the doctor cannot make room in his schedule and instead sends his son Andrew on an overnight flight to Minneapolis. The last 24 hours of Prince's life are really a snapshot of what happens in the final stages of opioid addiction. Opioid use begins in euphoria, in pleasure. It ends in despair, disintegration, and death. Effectively, opioid addiction in its final stages breaks down all the body's physical and mental systems. Emotionally, the opioid addict is depressed, anxious, angry, confused. Physically, all the major organs are affected, the heart, the brain, and eventually everything breaks down and the addict dies. So if we look at what happened to Prince during these last 24 hours, it begins with a representative, one of his representatives calling for a, a specialist to come over from California to help him deal with this addiction because obviously people are noticing it's in its final stages and he needs help. And what is extraordinary is that the specialist himself doesn't come because he's busy, can't make it. So he sends his son, sends his son. Presumably, because Prince ended up in his house alone on the evening of the 20th and the morning of the 21st, the specialists did not do enough either to help Prince and obviously not enough to save his life. Because those last few hours he spent in his recording studio, we can only imagine what happened after that. And the, the systemic and slow erosion of his mental faculties and his physical body culminated in him presumably drifting into unconsciousness and dying in the lift at his home, alone. April 21st, 2016, 9.30 a.m. Shortly after arriving at Paisley Park, Andrew Cornfield, along with Prince's longtime friend and personal assistant, Kirk Johnson and Marin Kekure, 
go looking for the superstar. To their horror, they find the lifeless body of Prince on the floor of the elevator. Nine forty three AM. An emergency call is made from Prince's Paisley Park mansion. Two one car for a medical Paisley Park seventy eight oh one Audubon Road. Seventy eight zero one Audubon Road for a fail down not treating. Rescue some started right now. And that's this you need a paramedical at Paisley Park, 7801 Audubon Road. Person down not breathing, can you proceed to 345? Ten oh seven AM. Emergency responders arrive at Paisley Park and Prince is pronounced dead. Schulenberg arrives at some point before police show up and tells an investigator that he was there to deliver test results to Prince, according to a search warrant. He also tells the investigator that he had prescribed oxycodone to be filled at a local pharmacy. When police search the property, they find hundreds of pills in the singer's home. Recently released police footage shows Prince's Paisley Park mansion as it was on the day he tragically died. Images have also been released showing several different marked and unmarked medicines, as well as an unidentified white powder. They responded to Paisley Park uh, to look for him and found him unresponsive in the elevator. We have no reason to believe at this point that this was a suicide. But again, this is early on in this investigation and uh, it's continuing to, uh, we'll continue to, to sure. investigate. So you received the call at 10, 12 yesterday morning to come and assist the Carver County Sheriff's Office in this investigation. Our chief medical examiner arrived on the scene at 11.30 yesterday morning, local time, and was on the scene for several hours. The autopsy this morning began at 9 a.m. Central Daylight Time and concluded at 1 p.m. And just shortly, I received word that his body did leave Midwest Medical Examiner's Office and was released to the family. June 2nd, 2016. It is announced that Prince died of a self-administered accidental overdose of the powerful drug, fentanyl. So the last moments of Prince's life was spent in the lift at his home. And it's said that he overdosed on fentanyl. Now, fentanyl is a synthetic opioid. It's like 50 times more powerful than morphine. It's an incredibly potent opioid. Uh, and it's used for, as all opioids are, uh, principally for, for pain relief. And, uh, but what opioids can do is they can slow the breathing, can slow the, the body system down, can lead to lightheadedness, can cause you to faint, to drift into unconsciousness, coma and death. So we can speculate that maybe Prince left the recording studio feeling faint, perhaps lightheaded, maybe a bit unsteady on his feet, thinking he might just take himself to bed, rest, sleep it off, get up the following day and continue what he was doing because he was notorious for his work ethic. He would work, you know, all hours got sense. He was an incredibly resilient and ferocious in his work ethic. But he may have felt it was too much, so he may have felt tired, sleepy, exhausted. Maybe he got in the lift, who knows? He may just have rested against the side of the lift, the back of the lift, and, and, and thought, oh, I just feel tired. And he may have drifted into unconsciousness, then drifted into a coma and then died. And that's probably the most likely sequence of events that uh, would have made up the, the last moments of Prince's life.
April 19, 2018. Mark Metz, Carver County attorney, announced that he was closing a two-year criminal investigation into Prince's death without filing any criminal charges. Metz stated that investigators were unable to develop credible evidence documenting the source of the fentanyl that killed the musician, who likely believed he was taking a prescription painkiller. In fact, the pills he took were counterfeit Vicodin. A civil settlement was reached with Dr. Schulenberg, who admitted prescribing Percocet to Prince's close associate, Kirk Johnson, knowing that it was, in fact, intended for Prince. For Prince, like for others before him, the doctors who administered those drugs to him were little more than legalized drug pushes. And it's crucial for us to understand that however rich you are, however famous you are, we all have the same brain, we all have the same nervous system, we all have the same appetites, the same hungers, the same capacity for excess, and the same capacity for self-destruction. And those who are the most narcissistic, which tend to be performers, need protection from themselves, and Prince didn't get it. Even when, in the last 24 hours of his life, they tried to get a specialist over to him, and the specialist never came. So let's speculate. What if the California specialist from California had made it to Prince's house on the day before he died? Would that have saved Prince's life? Probably not. It may have saved it that day. It may have got him through another day, another week, another month. Who knows? But one thing's for sure. Without structural and systemic changes to the way he was living and to the drugs he was putting into his body, eventually he would have died in the way that he died. It was only a matter of time. And what we have to realize is that if we want to save these lives, if we want to save people, we can't leave it so late and so hopelessly late that it's almost impossible to save them. We have to intervene earlier than that. And what's very difficult with a man like Prince, who is notoriously private, notoriously controlling in his behavior, is how do you get through to someone who is rich, famous, powerful, narcissistic, and controlling? And to be fair to those around him, those are pretty insurmountable barriers. But unless we try, unless somebody has the courage to say, you can fire me, you can do whatever you want, you can take my income away, but I am going to tell you this is how it is. And if that's the end of our relationship, then so be it. But at least I will walk out of here with a clean conscience. And with Prince, like Elvis before him, for instance, and many others, somebody has to have the courage to do that. And maybe they did, maybe people tried, we can only speculate. But without that kind of intervention, without somebody taking that risk, and above all, without Prince being willing at least to open himself to the fact that he needed help and he needed to stop what he was doing. But those are very difficult challenges. He was supposed to live till he was in his 90s, you know, doing concerts and joy. I mean, he just is all about joy and he brings so much joy to so many people. He loved to connect with you through the music. I mean, the Prince fans, the, all of the Prince fans, they know what I'm talking about. Everybody feels like they have. If you are a Prince fan, you feel like he has spoken to you. He's known worldwide, but he is a Minnesotan and we're all from Minnesota and when you lose one of our own, just like Kirby Pickett, you, you got to show up and show respect. He put everything he had into the music, everything. I mean, he lived at his studio, so, I mean, he just put everything that he had into it and he took stories from people's lives, from his own experiences in life, 
and put it into his music. And I think that's why the world just related to him, not so much as just a black artist, but as an artist in general. I mean, he had one of the, I mean, this is the most, you, you see all these people together and they are all united together to come. I think the world's gonna take a break from all the stuff that's been going on and just remember somebody that deserves it and has been there for everybody. I mean, he did a lot of children's events, a lot of, you know, disability events and, you know, he just put everything back into the community. He used to just pop up at the Chanhassen Theater and he would pop up at the McDonald's. He loved McDonald's. So I think um, just a little break for everybody, for all the hate that's out there right now to just reflect on this time. It's warming. It's warming. It's heartwarming that there's that all these people are here. It's cool. It's fun too. I mean, I'm here with my best friends, so like, yeah. I don't know. It's one of those things that no, we'll never forget for sure. It's. I think especially with him because he um, Prince is one of those artists that he just always looked amazing. He never. He never ever looked unwell or, or he, he looked at his physical peak all the time, even into his fifties. You know, I went to the last series of gigs that he did here in London, and he's still doing everything he did when I saw him 30 years ago. You know, he was still as vibrant and as an amazing, you know, so it's kind of, I think that's the shock factor, I think, is there for it as well. It's not like, you know, he, he'd gone into a decline or anything. He, he just looked amazing still. Um, and musically, I remember the first time I saw him uh, up in Wembley, and I literally went out of the gig and just kind of thought, I may as well just forget it. I mean, there's no point because no one's ever gonna get close to what he's just done tonight. That's just, it's from somewhere else. Um, and I mean, he, he did so many different things at such an amazing level. He's almost, almost freakish, I think. Um, because I think even rockers, you know, people who are like really into their guitar players and everything, he's still up there with some of those guys, you know what I mean? There's really no guitar players that would say that he's you know, he's, he's, he's up there with some of those people. Um, but just, uh, I think just, he was just amazing. He was just a super sexy dude who could do everything. Do you know what I mean? He was just amazing, yeah. Here's a person who combined uh, elements of James Brown with Jimi Hendrix and did it at the highest level of the world. And then in the meantime, was also controlling every single element of production of his music. to sum up Prince's legacy would be about his sheer raw talent, a guy who could play every single instrument on every single track, on every album, who released 39 albums in his career and left thousands of songs in a vault in his home on his death. I get the impression that no one need worry that they did not get the best of Prince. Because the best of Prince, it would appear to me, was not what he held back, but what he gave out. So in fact, we all got the best of Prince. It really is extraordinary how Purple Rain emerged as his song. Because when it was new, it wasn't his song. It was the theme of his movie, which won an Oscar for Best Original Song Score. And When Doves Cry was a bigger hit, and Let's Go Crazy was a bigger hit, and Purple Rain was a big hit, and it was the third of uh, the five singles from that album. But over time, uh, it really became his signature song. Of course, it in incorporated the word purple, he said, looking at his shirt. And I thought it was charming how when he died, everything went purple. The world is full of people who want the world, and they want it now. They want the money, they want the women, they want the sex, they want the fame, they want the adoration. 
but they don't put the time or the effort and they don't have the kind of intense passion for their art that Prince did. And it's that line that separates genius, if you want, those who go on to become artists of the caliber of Prince, and there's not many of them around. Prince, you know, is in a very small, thin group of the most iconic figures of 20th and 21st century art. And what people forget is that it's the hard work that makes it happen. Money, fame, success, and all the trappings that go with it come after. Prince knew that and it was in him, maybe because his father was a musician, his mother was a musician, but it was in him, composed his first song at the age of seven. When you have that kind of drive in you and you are able to sustain it, and you are determined to sustain it, and you work harder than anybody else works, that is what will make you successful. In a probably dark, bizarre way, um, sometimes the fact that people don't go, grow old and, and kind of wither and, you know, most of it, they're, they're kind of left in, you know, our mind's eye of them being that kind of perfect thing, you know? And um, I, I, look, I look at sometimes like someone like James Dean and kind of think, well, I don't know, I wasn't really around when he was doing his thing, if you like, but I'm saying you kind of look back and think, well, I'm sure he was amazing, and I've seen all his films and everything, but it, it's what would he have become if he'd become an old man? Do you know what I mean? And it's that, it's that, I don't know, you know, it's a, uh, I think that's the thing with Elvis for me, it's a little bit sad, is that most people, or a certain generation of people, think of Elvis in the white suit, being a bit overweight and kind of forgetting his lines. And when you go back to the moments when he was like a god, he was just unbeatable, you know, so, and I think Prince, you know, in my mind, will always remain that, that, that guy that I saw at Wembley that night, you know, who just couldn't get anywhere near, you know. The loss of a cultural icon such as Prince rocked the world. But perhaps most unsettling of all is that he was completely unaware that the medication he was taking was something much more dangerous. But nevertheless, the musician never held back, always gave a great show and always gave his all. His life was a party, and parties aren't meant to last. <laughs> 